scandalo. È scandalo. È scandalo e fa noise. E lui fa noise, ma lui sta parlando la verità. Scandalous means something that makes people stumble uh, can either. Jesus wouldn't make you stumble. Uh -huh. I'm just showing you the root. Exodus 
Exodus 34. Start with 29. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai, the two ta tables of the testimony in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. You know, that particular verse in the Bible is the basis for Michelangelo. If you have been to Rome, anyone here? Did you see the statue of Moses? He had two horns. That's Moses? Yeah, Moses had two horns. Michelangelo did that. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful statue. I mean the statue. And this verse from Exodus 34, verse 29, is because of that. Because in, in Greek, when you translate this in Greek, it will seem like Moses had horns when he came down on Mount Sinai. But actually, the, the correct translation is, his, his, uh, the skin of his face uh, was shining, his shiny face. It's different. His face was shining white. But because of the misunderstanding by Michelangelo, he had horns in his, okay? Now, um, Looking for there it is. Uh, the beginning of thirty-four. Where's the clock? It's thirty-three and thirty-four. I know that. Ezekiel thir Exodus thirty-three and thirty-four is the Old Testament account of the Good Shepherd. I thought I wrote them. Let me see. It's Exodus 33 to 34. Let me see Exodus chapter 3. Let's try 3 first. Okay. Exodus chapter 3 talks about Moses shepherding the flock of, uh, of his father-in-law Jethro. Remember that story, the Ten Commandments? Mm -hmm. Jethro was the father of like, what, six or seven maidens? The mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the plain. This is where he saw the burning bush. You can write this down, Exodus 33 and 34. It's where the account of a good shepherd is. The first account of a good shepherd in the Bible, Old Testament. You're talking about the, the chapter 33 and mm -hmm. 34? Yeah. The idea of a shepherd was first introduced in Exodus 3 when Moses was shepherding the flock of Jethro. 
is to be Father in it all. Anyway, I'll, I'll get it for you. <clears throat> one, one thing about, about the readings yesterday, uh, as I said in, in Acts chapter 4, they're saying, the stone which the uh, builders have rejected has become the cornerstone, right? Became the head of the corner. You know what the head of the cornerstone is? The corner, the corners, what they call the cornerstone is the first stone when they build a building. That's the first stone that they set. That's the cornerstone. And most likely, nobody will build a house uh, starting with the center. Nobody. All builders will tell you that they begin with the side, with the corners. Correct? So that's, that's why it's called the cornerstone. Because the first stone that's cast, that's laid down, is one of the cornerstones. And that, uh, that is the analogy of Jesus, being, having been rejected by the builders, rejected by the Jews, has now become the cornerstone and the very foundation of faith. Another thing is, uh, Jesus promised salvation because there's no salvation outside of Jesus. Hence the word salvation. When you hear the word salvation, what comes to mind? You see, saved, but that's it? But what does it mean to be saved? Let me tell you what, how the Muslims how the Muslims look at salvation. So you can identify and understand more their kind of thinking. To the Muslims, salvation means Eternal garden. So there's also eternal. Eternal garden of sensual delights. To the Muslims, that's that's salvation. So <clears throat> Look at the difference between Christians and Muslims. To the Muslims, they must obey Allah. They must obey Allah, and the reason they obey Allah is so they can have, they can enjoy sensual delights eternally. Imagine that. That is the guarantee of their salvation. Eternal sensual delights. You know what sensual delights are? Right? Sensual. What is sensual? It's not sexual. It's sensual. <laughs> sensual means senses. senses. Five senses. Yeah, our senses. So the Muslims believe that they have this joy from their senses eternally. But that's not what Jesus meant. When Jesus says, there's no other name by which you can be saved. It's not that. Because salvation to us and to Jesus. According to Jesus. Okay? Here we're talking, sharing the very life. Sharing the very life of God. That's salvation. So if you read the Quran, 
What they mean by salvation is eternal pleasure. Eternal pleasure. But pleasure is different to everybody. Different. That's the problem. That's the problem. Yeah. But they're sensual, meaning you can feel good feelings eternally. A big difference. A big distinction. According to Jesus, salvation is sharing the very life of God. It must be better than that. That's why St. Peter, in one of his epistles, says, we become partakers of the divine nature of God. Because we share in the very life of God. So, this means divine sonship. That's why it brings. When you share the very life of God, then that's divine sonship. First time you heard this. The difference between what about the others, other people like Buddha? There's very limited uh, resources on Buddha. Uh, Buddha never claimed to be God. Buddha also never promised a way to salvation. Muhammad did. Muhammad never claimed to be God. But he claimed the way to salvation and that is obedience. To them, obedience. There's only one obedience. Obedience, if you don't obey, you will not uh, enjoy the eternal garden of sensual desires or delights. Sorry, not delights, desires, delights. Sensual delights. Now, what is our eternal destiny? Do you know what is our eternal destiny? In the CCD classes, it's made very simple. Our eternal destiny is heaven, heaven which is not a place, by the way. Uh, of course, to know, love, and serve God and, and enjoy Him forever, which is, of course, here too. Now, it's hard to the reason this is worded this way is because nobody really had full comprehension of what the afterlife is like. Nobody. The church never claimed knowing exactly what the afterlife is, afterlife is like. The Bible says <clears throat> when we are in eternal communion with God, we will see Him as He truly is. Remember that from yesterday? Mm -hmm. We will see Him as He really is. God. But you have to die first before you see God. You cannot see God alive. I mean alive in this sense, in this term. Remember, He's God of the living, not of the dead. But in order for people to understand, you must say that. Okay? So, salvation, all we can say is salvation is sharing the very life of God. And that entails divine sonship. We become children of God, sons and daughters of God. Actually, that's just an accommodating term. There's no such word as sons and daughters of God. We are all children of God. Because in heaven, there's no such thing as man or woman. There's no such thing as husband and wife. There's no such thing as mother and daughter. We're all the same in heaven. Mind-boggling? That's what it is. 
But again, that's the, that's the extent of what we can say, because nobody has full comprehension of what the actual life is like. Okay? Now, Psalm 23, as you know well, Ezekiel 34. I have to highlight it. 11? 